turn to one another in prayer. Like for, if you will, we turn this evening to Romans chapter 8. Romans chapter 8. And we want to read verses 28 through 30 to begin with. Uh, this is some familiar verses of Scripture. Uh, we was talking about some things, and I, I've mentioned this before. You can uh, a verse of scripture can be familiar. You can read it over and over. You can preach it over and over, and then at times you come back to it, and, and God just shows you a little more, shows you something more, uh, uh, more that is there, and uh, gives you enlightenment. Sometimes it is. Uh, things that are, are you're experiencing now, and as you read that verse, you see different ways in which it can apply. But uh, I, I saw some some things here, and I wanted to share them with you uh, this evening. Romans 8:28, and we know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are the called according to His purpose. For whom he did foreknow, he also did predestinate to be conformed to the image of his Son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. Moreover, whom he did predestinate, and them he also called, and whom he called, them he also justified, and whom he justified, them he also glorified. And we want to uh, pause there for uh, a moment. The Apostle Paul lays out God's everlasting plan for the redemption and salvation of his people. It reveals uh, a sovereign, that God is sovereign and that he is the author and the finisher of our faith. Hebrews 12, 2 uh, says, Looking unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith. And there in Revelation, he's, you know, I'm the first, and I'm the last. I'm the Alpha and the Omega. Uh, he is everything uh, from beginning to end and everything in between. But then Paul proceeds to ask a question. And as I think about it, I think because men will always question what God says. I think that's just the nature of man. And it's because Satan, our adversary Satan, wants us to question what God has said. And uh, he said there in, in Genesis 3, what had God said? And, and I was reading over there, that's, Turn back there for a moment. I was reading there in Genesis chapter 3. Uh, initially just went there to get that verse uh, I have thought said. Um, but in Genesis chapter 3 verse 1, Now the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said unto the woman, Yea, hath God said, Ye shall not eat of every tree of the garden. And the woman said unto the serpent, We may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden, but of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God has said, Ye shall not eat of it, neither shall ye touch it, lest ye die. And the serpent said unto the woman, Ye shall not surely die. For God doth know that in the day ye eat thereof, your eyes shall be opened, and ye shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. And one of the things I was noticing there is how when Satan approached Eve, his question, ye, 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 look at yourself, look at yourself. You know, and he said, you know, I have God said, question God, but everything else was ye, ye, you know, focusing on, uh, on you. And that's how Satan uh, operates. And so, and I think Paul has probably run into all these questions himself, and that's one of the reasons in the scriptures when he's writing to Romans, and he's laying out these truths, he knows people are going to question 
what he has said. Uh, even sometimes God's people, Satan gets in their uh, minds and thinking and, and, and causes them to question. Uh, he uses outside influences and uh, the laws uh, to question and bring up questions uh, against what God has said. And so uh, Paul asks this question, what shall we then say to these things? Um, he's just laid out uh, this verses, these verses of Scripture. He's just laid out here God's sovereignty. Uh, he says, we know that all things work together for them that love God. Uh, and he says, what shall we then say to these things? Man and, and Satan uh, speaking to man will always challenge what God says. And I'm sure that uh, uh, Paul had heard these things. And God knows our hearts and how Satan will try and twist the scripture into a negative. As I was looking at these things, I think, you know, that, that's the way man is. When, when they question it, they always take what God says and tries to twist it and present it as a negative. Well, you can't do this. You can't do that. Well, if God did that, that wouldn't be fair. And what about, what about, what about man's free will and all these things? It always seems like uh, they, they put it in a, a negative because man and even God's people, I think this too is kind of part of our nature, and Satan knows this, and that's the reason he plays upon it. We tend to question or oppose anything that we think of as being negative. And so, uh, if Satan can take these things and twist it and, and set forth it as a question, and get us to doubting, and, and then he insinuates it and brings in his lie and to counter it once we have begun to question it and to resist it because, well, that sounds negative. So uh, we're much more uh, prone to resist, to oppose and reject something if it is a negative. And so God uses Paul here to counter that with a question of his own and framing the, the question then as a positive. And uh, so he, what shall we say to these things? And then he turns around and he points out, now this is what, as believers, this is what our attitude ought to be. This is our 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 uh, take on this. This is how we approach this. Is what this means to us is if God be for us, who can be against us? See, doesn't that put that in a, in a positive light? And so, before Satan can begin to question, before Satan can twist it into a negative, and Paul asks this question to to cause us to think about these things. And he said, you know, what should we say to these things? And when people begin to question it, what should we say? Well, if God be for us, who can be against us? Now, this is a statement in the form of a question. And, of course, the obvious answer is no one. And this is the ob obvious conclusion that the child of God should come to. Now, now, keeping in mind Paul's beginning statement, verse 28, all things work together for good to them that love God. Now, isn't that a positive statement? All things work together for good. But it doesn't work for good for everybody. He says it, it's for those that love God. And, and of course, then people began to say, well, I love God. You know, we love God. And so he further defines to whom he's referencing this. This doesn't uh, reference
hurts everybody. You know, obviously there's a lot of people in this world that uh, things that have happened uh, it's, has not been for their good. Uh, but uh, he says, here all things work together for good to them that love God. Well, who is it that loves God? Well, 1 John 4 says we love him, we love God because he first loved us. And so uh, that which had followed was to help to identify who is it that loves God? Those whom God loved first. He says, I've loved you with an everlasting love, therefore with loving kindness have I drawn thee. Uh, he goes on to uh, identify them as those uh, who are called according to his purpose. And he uses it, uh, he phrases it as a noun. Uh, those who love God, those who are the called according uh, to his purpose. And then verses 29 through 30 is given to explain whom this uh, statement uh, applies to. All things work together for good. Why, why is it that everything's working together for good? Well, he goes through and lays it out here for us. All these, in the mind of God, the purpose of God, our salvation, he has purposed it and he has set it in motion and he will bring it to pass just like he said from in eternity past in our uh, election and choosing God uh, all the way down uh, to in eternity in the future in glory uh, when we will receive our glorified bodies and then everything in between. God is good. So if he uh, gave his son to die for our sins, there is nothing good that he would withhold from us. We have but to ask, and that's the, the you know, if God be for us, who can be against us? And then he further expounds upon that thought of uh, he that spared not his son, own son, but delivered him up for us all. How shall he not with him also freely give us all things? And so, again, going back to we know that all things work together for good to them that love God, who are the called according to his purpose. So, God is good. And over and over in the scripture, he tells us that God knows how to give good gifts. See, every good gift, every perfect gift cometh down from above. And so, God is good. And, and so, if God has done all this, and He has sent His Son uh, to die for our sins, He did not withhold the one thing most precious to Him, the most valuable thing to Him, but delivered Him up that we might have the forgiveness of sin. Would He also with Him, through Him, freely give us all things. And so Paul says in another place, we, we're a child of God, we're heirs of God, and joint heirs with Jesus Christ. We stand in that uh, position that we inherit all things. We're an heir of God. So anything that belongs to God, anything that's His, we partake of that. We share that. We're an, uh, an heir to all those things. To his power, uh, to his glory, to his love, to the heavens and the earth and everything that's in them, the cattle on a thousand hills. You know, everything. It all belongs to him. And we're heirs of that. So, now let us return to the, the question. And I've entitled this message, I probably should have brought this out a little bit earlier. Why, it's in the form of a question. Why question God? Why would we question Him? I, I can understand why the lost do. But uh, as a child of God, because this was written to God's people and to encourage us 
but understanding we are going to face those who are skeptics. We're going to face those that are scorners, and they're going to raise questions. Do not allow Satan to put a question in your mind. Why question God? Now, Paul follows this with a series of questions to elaborate upon his question here, who uh, can be against us? See, then, if you, what shall we say to these things? Well, the response is, if God be for us, who can be against us? And the next, there's three questions here, elaborate in more detail and, and follows that train of thought. Who can be against us? And the first question he asks them, uh, in verse 33, says, Who shall lay anything to the charge of God's elect? Maybe I, I just thought of a different title for this. We was talking about this at the conference, Brother Crisp and all. And he says, you know, uh, you can take your message, but if you have a catchy title, People are more likely, you know, especially if you post them on the internet. If you have some kind of catchy title, people are more likely to listen to it and download it. This, this all has something about three owls. Who, who, who. <laughs> I'm going to have to work on that a little bit and, and come out with a, some kind of, about three owls. Uh, that... We ought to avoid. Uh, or three owls that can't hurt us. Who shall lay anything to the charge of God's elect? And notice, <laughs> yeah, he uses that word, doesn't he? Elect. See, that goes back to the fact he said, Though, who loves God? Who are the called according to his purpose? He's talking about an elect. And so, and, and Paul comes right out and says it here. That might upset some people. But he comes right out and, and says, Who shall lay anything to the charge of God's elect? You know, if God be for us. And so, he responds to that. It is God that justifies. If God, be for, if God has justified us, you know, Satan tries to cast the doctrine of election as a negative. And we, we've talked about that. But, and in doing so, tries to question God's justice. Why? Why question God's justice? It is God that justified. Over in, in Romans chapter 3, back up a few pages. We find this very familiar uh, text. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God, being justified. Now here's, this is a kind of a legal term and perspective. God is holy. He is just. He is the lawgiver. He is the judge. And he is the executioner. And so uh, it's declared we've all sinned and come short of the glory of God. All of us that are saved we, we have sinned and come short of the glory of God. But we are justified freely. And, and he, what he describes here is how it is that we who have sinned against God and are guilty and under condemnation and deserve judgment, how can we be set free? How can we be pardoned justly? Well, he describes it for us here. Being justified free by his grace, first of all. Unmerited favor. It's not because of anything that you and I have done. It's not because of anything that... Uh, we are able to uh, keep his laws or keep his commandments or, or anything that we do. It's by his grace. It's unmerited 
favor. Uh, and it's through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. The redemption is the price that was paid to purchase us unto God. Whom God has set forth to be a propitiation through faith in his blood. And we've, we've taught on that and explained what that word propitiation means. And that's at the, the root of how God is just. And his, his justice. God punished our sins in Jesus Christ. His perfect righteousness, which he lived in the flesh, is imputed to us. Our sin was imputed to him and he went to the cross. He who knew no sin became sin for us and God in his holiness and his righteousness punished that sin. And we now stand before him in the righteousness of Jesus Christ uh, as righteous and therefore he is able to justify us. God has set forth to be a propitiation through faith in his blood to declare his righteousness for the remission of sins that are past through the forbearance of God to declare, I say at this time, his righteousness that he might be just and the justifier of him which believeth in Jesus. Don't question it. You know, why question the justice of God? God is infinitely wise. He is infinitely just. He is infinitely holy. And that which he has done, we know it is right to question the justice of God is to question the very deity of God. Which is exactly what Satan wants us to do. It is God that justifies to declare His righteousness. God is right. And He did that which enables Him to forgive and pardon our sins and still be just. He is just and the justifier. Through Jesus Christ. And they said, How shall he not with him freely give us all things? Through Jesus Christ, God has provided us who believe with a perfect righteousness and the forgiveness of sin. None can lay a charge or accusation against us. You know, who shall lay any? charge you know, against God's elect. Satan can't. But he wants us to question that in our mind. Secondly, he says, and, and this kind of goes along with, but who is he that condemneth? Condemnation is due to our sins. We read there in John 3, uh, Gospel of John, you're familiar with John 3, 16, but John 3, 17 through 19, he talks about the condemnation. Jesus didn't come into this world to condemn sinners. Why? Because they were already under condemnation. Jesus didn't come to add any condemnation. We're already condemned. And that's uh, what he says there. It's in this is the condemnation that light has come into the world and men love darkness rather than light. Men have a depraved nature and we're under a just condemnation and we ought to have a sense of our guilt and condemnation until we look to Jesus for eternal life. Romans 8 1 says therefore there is therefore now no condemnation. That condemnation has been removed through Jesus Christ. And so uh, we look at this and say, why question God's veracity or truthfulness? He said, there is now no condemnation. So who can condemn us? It is Christ, and he says here, it is Christ that died. And again, this is going to 
This is uh, the record that God has given to us of His Son. Now this is the gospel that Jesus Christ uh, died for our sins according to the scriptures, was buried and rose again the third day according to the scriptures and was seen. This was uh, something that was known. And so it is Christ that died. 1 Timothy 1, 5 said this is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptation that Christ Jesus came into this world to save sinners. And so he came into this world. He lived that perfect life. He went to the cross. Our sin was laid upon him. And he died for our sin. And he was buried. But he goes on. But even more so, he was raised again. And in that he was raised, it showed our sin was gone. And if our sin is gone, what? What is it that condemns us? It is our sin that condemns us. But if our sin be gone, and there is no more sin, and that was the significance of him rising from the dead, then there is no condemnation. There is nothing to condemn us. It is Christ that died, yea, rather, that is risen again, who is even at the right hand of God, who also maketh intercession for us. So yeah, well, he died for your past sins, but what happens after that? Well, notice 1 John 1. See, some people ha have the, the idea, yeah, that Jesus died for your sins, and you believe him, and all of your sins from that point to the past are forgiven. But now it's up to you not to sin anymore. It's up to you uh, to keep your salvation, to keep yourself. And, and if we sin, we can lose our salvation and so on. So who's he that condemneth? You see, and, and that's the way some people uh, look at that. But 1 John 1, 7 says, But if we walk in the light, as he is in the light, we have fellowship one with another. And the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses us from all sin. His blood cleanses us from all sin. And that's the idea. It didn't just do it once in the past, but it keeps on cleansing us. So even though I, I, I'm saved, I have the forgiveness of sin, but... If I sin now, what, what becomes of that sin? It's covered. It's under the blood. And that sin may hinder our fellowship. But here, because that's what he's talking about here, we have fellowship with him. And so, uh, we see verse 8. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. And so this has to do with questioning the truth, questioning the veracity of God, because he said, your sins are gone. Isn't that what he tells us? We put our faith and trust in him. Our sins are gone, never to be remembered again. And if our sins are gone, never to be remembered again, who condemns us? Where can there be any grounds, any foundation for condemnation. That's why he said there is therefore now no condemnation to them who are in Christ Jesus. Now those that are outside of Christ, obviously, the condemnation still abides on them. The wrath of God abides upon them. And they will die in their sins with that condemnation. Stand before God and be judged and condemned for their sins and cast out of his presence into the lake of fire. That is true. But to those who uh, in Christ Jesus, there is therefore now no condemnation. He maketh intercession for us. He is seated at the right hand of the throne of God as our high priest who ministers the, the blood of the sacrifice in the presence of God that we might have the forgiveness of sin. So when we sin... And we come and we confess our sin. says he's faithful and he's just 
to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If Christ's death on the cross only paid for our sins that were past, you know, he said, well, they're in Rome. I, you know, I haven't quite thought of it that way, but um, where he says to declare his righteousness uh, that for the remission of sins that are past to declare, I say at this time, his righteousness. So, even though we've sinned, his sacrifice for our sin did just cover our sins that are past, but those that will be future as well. And so, uh, he is at the right hand of the throne of God, making intercession for us. Not only did he rise showing our sins were gone, but he's now seated at the right hand of God. There continuing as our high priest, continuing uh, to uh, present, if you will, the blood of the sacrifice that was made there and to plead the blood of Christ for our sins. And so when we come to God and we confess our sins, he is faithful and he's just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness that we might continue in fellowship with him. If we say that we have not sinned, we make him a liar. And his word is not in us. Those, those that say, oh, I, I haven't sinned. I, you know, I, since the day I, I was baptized and all, I, I haven't sinned. Well, you're making God a liar because he says we've all sinned. He said, that's not possible. Why question God's veracity or truthfulness? And then he asks a third question. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? So here's these three things. It covers when you look at these three questions and how they apply. You know, who shall lay anything to the charge of God's elect? Who shall condemn us? And who shall separate us from the love of Christ? And these all go back to that If God be for us, who can be against us? Which goes back to his uh, statement, all things work together for good to them who love God, who are the call according to his purpose. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? It is hard to imagine sometimes how Christ could love us, but don't doubt it. Uh, 1 John 4, you know, we talked about that where uh, it says we love him because he first loved us, but uh, notice some things here. Don't doubt his love uh, for you. Uh, verse 9 says, In this was manifested the love of God toward us, because that God sent his only begotten Son into the world that we might live through him. Here in his love, not that we love God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. God has loved us and he sent his son to die for us, to be the propitiation, the place of mercy and reconciliation for our sins. You know, that's what Satan, he was, God, did God really love you that much? You know, God hates God hates sin, and you, and you have sinned, and you're such a sinner. How can God love you? Well, we're sin about Grace did much more abound. Uh, God's love and His grace and His mercy is greater than that of our sins. I think of that verse of Scripture uh, in the Old Testament where He describes our sins. He, he's put them behind His back. You know, said, and He's trying to illustrate how, how can we uh, think how our sins are gone never to be remembered again he says well as far as the east is from the west that's, where, that's how far your sins are as far as the east is from the west and in between that and that big gap that's God's infinite love and mercy and grace and it'll keep it there you know our sins are gone, never to be brought up again, never to be remembered. Uh, they're gone. But, you know, Satan would, would question, how can God love a sinner like you? 
Well, he did. And he manifested that. He made it visible in that he sent his son Jesus Christ to die for my sins. Jesus died for my sins. Therefore, I know he loves me. Uh, there is perhaps the best expression of that is in the children's song. Jesus loves me. This I know. For the Bible told me so. So get thee behind me, Satan, you know. Why question God's love? Is there any circumstance that can separate us from the love of Christ? Verses 35 through 36 uh, expresses a, a number of uh, circumstances. Uh, Said, shall tribulation, distress, persecution, famine, nakedness, peril, the sword, now these are a lot of circumstances that, that may come into our lives, may threaten our physical lives uh, with, with harm, with the, I sorry to say depravity, but deprivation of the, depriving us of, of things uh, that we feel necessary to, our, to sustain our lives. Uh, but none of these things can separate us from the love of God that is given to us in Christ Jesus. And he says, you know, uh, it is written, like it is written. He said, for thy sake we are killed all the day long. We are counted as sheep for the slaughter. Paul says, let it come. You know, if tribulation comes, if I, if, if I die, let it be to the glory of God. I belong to Him. I'm Him to do with as He pleases. He loves me and I'm going to trust Him with that. And so, He says, no, so in all these things, we're more than conquerors through Him that loves us. And then begin with verse 38. He asked, uh, verse 38 through 39, is there any power, is there any entity in heaven and earth at all, past, present, future, is there any power that is sufficient to separate us from the love of Christ? And again, uh, the answer is, is no. And he lists all of these things. And he goes on, Paul says, I am persuaded. I like that. I am persuaded. Instead of resisting or rejecting or rebelling against the word of God, be persuaded. Like the Apostle Paul. Being persuaded here is a good thing to be. Paul says in, in Romans 4, uh, 19 through verse 21, he's talking about Abraham. Uh, turn back there. I try to just kind of quote from memory. I'm going to mess it up. But verse 19, he's talking about Abraham. He said, And being not weak in faith, he considered not his own body now dead when he was about a hundred years old, neither yet the deadness of Sarah's womb. He staggered not at the promise of God through unbelief, but was strong in faith, giving glory to God, and being fully persuaded that he that had promised, he was able also to perform. Or he's persuaded that, that what he had promised, he was able also to perform. Abraham was persuaded. And he is set forth here as an example to us. And we are blessed with faithful Abraham when we are faithful. He was full of faith. Uh, Paul in 2 Timothy 1.12, Paul says, I am persuaded. He says, I know whom I have believed. And I am persuaded that he is able to keep that which I have committed unto him against that day. Hebrews 11, talk about the, 
the patriarchs and the saints in the Old Testament and how God had made these promises and they had not yet been fulfilled but having seen them afar off they were persuaded of them and embraced them and I believe that is what is God's people we need to do Paul was persuaded that nothing could or would be able to separate us from the love of God which is given to us in Christ Jesus. Now when I read this uh, and it goes through this list, I, I can just see Paul just getting excited and getting worked up as, as he's expressing this. He says, For I am persuaded that neither death nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Oh, what a, what a blessing. That's why he said in verse 28, now we know, <laughs> we know that all things work together for good to them who love God, to them who are the call according to His purpose. What shall we say to these things? If God be for us, who can be against us? Don't question. Don't listen to those owls. The who? that Satan would send to whisper in your ear. Let us stand together.